right, hello there everyone. My name is Jess Morris. I'm here at the Denison Pequot Seacoast Nature Center and we are here talking about uh, Endangered Species Day. This is the 15th annual Endangered Species Day and it's a really important topic to cover. With me I have some of our resident animals who are in fact on the Connecticut Endangered Species list. Right, Jess, because there's two different endangered species lists, correct? There are in, indeed. Uh, there's the federal list, uh, and then there are state lists um, by state. So those are more local. And uh, we're going to be focusing on the Connecticut endangered species list. Um, here in my hand, I've got Kingsley. Some of you may have met Kingsley before. She is our resident short-eared owl, and she's actually considered threatened on the endangered species list. Um, so if we're going to classify the different uh, levels on the list, threatened means that their uh, population is in decline and they are in, at risk of becoming endangered. Uh, once they do get onto that endangered list, that means they are in pretty big trouble um, and going on towards extinction. Uh, so what we're really hoping for with these lists, uh, both state and federal lists, is that it helps us to protect the animals and hopefully conserve them and help get those populations back up on the rise. Um, now, Kingsley here, being a short-eared owl, she is migratory. Uh, she also will nest on the ground. Um, these are two factors that really have played into the population decline, um, as well as the areas in which they nest. They, prefer to be in open uh, marshes and grasslands and things like that. Um, she was actually picked up uh, on Shoeville Road in Ledger, which has lots and lots of fields. It's really great uh, habitat for short-eared owls. However, that is one of the major habitats that is being um, destroyed for various reasons, um, whether it's for development of human communities um, or things like that. So these owls, um, though, like I said, they are migratory. Um, they don't spend their whole time here. They actually come down in winter in Connecticut, uh, and then they will go back up and, um, breed up north. Uh, but being that they are on the ground when they nest, that can be a little bit troubling for them. Um, their habitat that's being destroyed is not only where they're hunting, but it's also where they're trying to raise their young. Uh, so that can be really troubling if that habitat gets destroyed. Now, um, Jess, yep. how do they get the name short-eared owl? Oh, these guys are, so you actually can't really see it right now. Um, Kingsley will, when she's very relaxed, put up little tiny feather tufts up on the top of her head, um, right above her ear, or right above her eyes. Um, I guess it is above her ears too, because those feather tufts are not in fact her ears. Uh, her ears reside on the side of her head, just like ours, um, underneath her faceplate, which is that uh, sort of white circle you can see around her face. Uh, and owls have asymmetrical ears, is that right? Many do, yes, and it helps them to pinpoint their prey. Um, having one ear a little higher on the head and the other one uh, a little bit lower helps them so that they can tell exactly where that prey is coming from, uh, whether it's up higher or lower, um, and which direction it's in. And we have some great people that are tuning in today. We have Louise from Webster, Mass. We also have Joseph James from New Jersey. Wow. We have Broad, uh, Broadbrook, Connecticut as well, so we have some great people tuning in. So Jess, what would short-eared owls eat? So these guys are mainly eating small mammals. Um, and they are hunting low to the ground, uh, which is not like too many other of our raptors or our birds of prey. Um, and one thing I want to show you, if she'll let me, because they nest on the ground and because they hunt so low to the ground, the feathers on the back of them are kind of blurry looking. I'm not sure if the video shows it, but it really kind of messes with your eyes when you're taking a look at their backs. Um, so what that does is it helps them when they're hunting um, and when they're protecting their young, when they're sitting on that nest, helps them to stay camouflaged. Um, they are uh, 
a diurnal owl, or more diurnal, I should say, than many owls. So they're hunting oftentimes during the day. Uh, so they do have to watch out for other daytime birds of prey, um, hence why they have that camouflage. Oh, Jess, you have a fan that tuned in. Hi. Jack says hello, and he misses you. Oh. All right, so these are again a um, species of threatened yes, so designation. Are... So that starts on the endangered species list of kind of the lowest tier, which again is still important. There's a reason they're on there of special concern that goes to threatened. And then what happens after that? And then it becomes endangered. And then if it continues to decline, that's when we would get extinction. So which it's important. There would be no individuals left in the wild. And so that's why it's an important thing that we have these animals here. So um, Kingsley came to live with us being designated as unreleasable after that, um, the car strike, as you said, I believe it was in Ledger. Yep. And Kingsley has been with us two years, three uh, years. Two, three years, yeah. Yep. And what sort of injury did Kingsley sustain? So her injury is um, to her wing. And though she can fly a little bit, um, for instance, if I were to release her in this room, she might be able to fly around the room a couple of times before uh, tiring. Unfortunately, that's just not good enough for a migratory bird. So her wing, the damage to her wing was um, too severe to allow her to fly those long distances. All right. So are there other animals that we have with us today? We do have some other animals with us today. So I'm going to go ahead and get Kingsley safe and sound back in her little dark carrier. And, you, and while you do so, we're going to go over, because this is not one of the animals that we have out, but for anyone that has come to the Nature Center before, and we look forward to having you return with us, um, these are spotted turtles. And spotted turtles, we have spot and dot. If you can see here behind the glass, hopefully without too much of my reflection, um, those are species of special concern that are here in Connecticut. Okay. Kingsley is put away, so Jess is going to do a great reveal of the two other turtle species that we have out today. All right, so I'm going to bring up Clementine here. And what is Clementine? Clementine is one of our northern box turtles. Um, so the box turtles um, are a species of special, special concern, um, like our spotted turtles, and actually Today we're going to be talking about three different turtles, and I think it's important to um, make note that in Connecticut, including our sea turtles, we have 14 species of turtle, and nine of those species are on our endangered species list. Um, worldwide, 80% of turtles are on that list. So it's really important that we understand um, turtles and their habitats and how we can help preserve that um, and preserve them. Um, now, Clementine is one of four box turtles that we have here. Unfortunately, all of our box turtles came to us because they were illegally kept as pets, um, and they are unable to be released if they are held as pets uh, for any amount of time. So what ended up happening is, luckily, they were able to come here, and we are able to care for them properly um, so that she can live out the rest of her life with us. Um, now, these guys do live a very long time, which is why it can be an, a terrible thing to keep them as a pet. Um, they live up to 70 years. Some have been known to live even up to 100 years. Um, so if you try to take one of these guys as a pet, that is a really long commitment, and it is really hard to keep them healthy. Um, and it's an important thing to note that they take a while to reach um, breeding age as well. And there is something that I believe our friends over at the Connecticut Deep had shared is that there are some current studies that are going on that are showing that there are more adults of these species. Um, and that's the eastern box turtle as opposed to juveniles. So what they're finding is, again, because of habitat disruption, um, that there are less of these guys that are out there that are going to take the place of their older counterparts. Mm -hmm. So it's important for us to be able to show these to you today because, as Jess shared, these are special concern here in Connecticut. For anyone that's tuning in from Rhode Island, um, they are as well. And you said most of New England, I think. Yep, yep. Um, so most of southern New England and New York. 
And we can also tell, so one of the fun things that I've learned as a communications person and not a biologist, is that if you happen to find an eastern box turtle, you can tell if it's a male or female just by also looking at her eyes. So we can tell that she is a female because she does not have red eyes. Versus if you guys joined us for our other Facebook Live with, I think we did Clyde. Clyde has very red eyes. Indeed. And another way to tell the difference is if you look at the plastron. And that um, plastron is the under part of the shell. Yeah. The females have a flatter plastron um, versus a male that would be concave, right? Females need to be able to hold eggs in their body, so they don't want that concave part of the plastron. Um, and so that's another way that you can tell with these guys. Uh, actually, while I have her up um, like so, I want to point out this hinge here that she has. That hinge is like a door hinge that can close up her shell. So box turtles are extremely well protected. Um, as adults because they're able to go into their shell and close it up. Now, they don't get that hinge until they're about four to five years old. So those young box turtles are not as well protected as the adults. And there's a lot of things that would probably like to eat a young box turtle. Indeed. So what would be those things? Maybe things like raccoons? Yeah, raccoons, foxes, um, some birds of prey will go after them. Um, some water birds, like a, a great blue heron, uh, might go after them if, if they're uh, around that area. Um, so there's really a lot of animals that could take a young box turtle out. Now, adult box turtles are very much well protected. There's not a lot that can get to them, but cars. This shell cannot withstand a car. Um, so a lot of the problem with our box turtles are car strikes. Um, as well as um, habitat degradation. So these guys um, live more in a well-drained forest, um, often deciduous forests, but they can um, range around um, all different kind of foresty areas. But it's a really small range. Um, I've read Very that small. it's about an acre or so. So that's yeah. why it's so critically important. If you find box turtles, um, be excited about finding them, but make sure that you're not moving them because, again, it's a very small range that they have, and that's so important to their care. Absolutely. And actually, um, something that is a fun thing to do if you do find a box turtle and you're obviously going to leave it alone, you can snap a picture of it. And because they have such a small range, if this is an area that you're hiking around often, you might be able to find that box turtle several times. So if you snap that picture, their shell and their head have its own unique marking. Kind Almost of, like their own fingerprint? Yeah, kind of like our fingerprints. So you can actually keep track of local turtles. Um, and that's a really good way to interact with them without moving them and without disturbing them from their natural habitat. I know. I'm looking forward to trying that because we have an eastern box turtle that resides in our neighborhood, oh. and many of us will help um, hope, help it cross the road. Mm -hmm. um, so if we do find a turtle, because sometimes these guys do cross the road, what are the tips that we give people at home? Yes. So um, like I said, car strikes are one of the major reasons that um, our turtles get injured um, or killed. And... The best thing to do if you see a turtle uh, and it's in the middle of the road or you know towards the side of the road and it looks like it's going to cross, if you are in a safe place to do so, you can take that turtle and bring it to the other side of the road, whichever way it's facing. Don't ever try to put it back where it was, um, even if it looks like that's a better spot for it. These are usually female turtles that are laden with eggs trying to find a place to lay them. Um, so we want to make sure that they are headed in the same direction um, and you can just put them right on the other side of the road and let them go their way. They know exactly where they want to go. And if you put them in the wrong direction, chances are very likely that they will attempt again. So it's better to put them in the direction they're headed. Now, it's great that you happen to mention eggs because we have a question that just came in. Oh. How many eggs do they lay and how big are the eggs? And they love our programs. Thank you. <laughs> um, these guys lay about three to eight eggs um, in a nest, so really not too many eggs. Um, <clears throat> and, well, honestly, I'm not sure the size. Uh, these are a relatively small turtle, um, so I can't imagine the eggs would be too much bigger than 
Maybe that size. And we can look that up and post it for you later. Because yeah. there's yeah. one thing that we have learned is that we know a lot of things, but sometimes with specific questions, we love to chime in and give you even more facts later. Absolutely. All right, so this is a lovely, again, Eastern box turtle. These are of special concern here in Connecticut, most of New England as well, so those that are tuning in from elsewhere. Um, and when we're done as well, we will also share that federal endangered species list. So that way, if we have anyone that's tuning in from other states, you can see those designations as well. All right. All right. Go so, ahead and put her back in here. Clementine did a great job as our program animal today. And then who do we have next? Uh, not least, she is one of everybody's favorites. I like to call her our shaw celebrity <laughs> because I love puns. We've got Gem, our Diamondback Terrapin. All right, so I'm going to get in close because yep. Gem to me has some of the most striking colorations. Yep, so being a Diamondback Terrapin, that means that she's living in brackish water. Uh, which is a mixture of salt and fresh water. So we'll see these guys in estuaries and along the coasts where uh, fresh water meets the ocean. And you can see, because she's doing a great job showing those back flippers. Oh yeah, she needs to have some really strong legs and arms and extremely well webbed as well in order to fight the currents. If she's coming back upstream to get some fresh water, or to fight the tides if she's going out to catch some food. Okay, and so what are the things that Jim and other diamondback terrapins would eat because they're in brackish water like Long Island Sound? Yeah, so these guys will eat things like um, shrimp and clams and mussels. They'll go after fish sometimes, um, scallops, all, all those sorts of things. A lot of times they're going for animals that don't move so fast. Um, so obviously your bivalves and a lot of your mollusks don't move as fast. Um, so that's what they're going to really crave. Now, Jem has also favorite things, um, of the things that we feed her here. She sure does. And now as someone that helps in animal care, what are some of Jem's particular favorites? Her absolute favorite, scallops and shrimp. That's what she wants every single time, but we will feed her other things as well to get her a nice variety. All right. So... How old is Jem? So we were just figuring this out. Jem is probably around nine or 10 years old. And she's one that we can really tell her age because she was taken out of the wild as a baby. Um, unfortunately, um, when she was taken out of the wild, it was assumed that she was not able to survive on her own because baby diamondback terrapins are only about as large as this scoot here. They're very, very teeny tiny. And someone thought that um, the best thing to do would be to rescue this baby turtle. But really, turtles hatch out very small and they hatch out knowing exactly how to survive and exactly what to do in order to reach adulthood as long as they don't get taken out by a predator. Um, so that was un a really unfortunate event. Um, and it, me it means that Jem has never seen the wild, um, except for maybe a couple of days after her hatching. Right, because turtles, um, once they are taken from the wild, are not able to be released. And why is that? Is that because of things that they might potentially pick up and then um, bring out there? That is definitely a big part of it. Um, we wouldn't want to put a captive turtle out into the wild and spread disease. Um, they also, in, in Jem's case, she doesn't know how to hunt for herself. She's only ever been given her food. And it's usually cut up into little tiny, easy to eat bites. Right. So uh, that instinct has been replaced with um, imprinted behaviors. Exactly. Exactly. Now, Jess, one thing that we were chatting about before we went live this morning is diamondback terrapins have a much shorter life expectancy versus our friend, the eastern box turtle. They do. So um, these guys live to be about 12 years in the wild. Um, they also have a small egg clutch size, just like the box turtles. Um, they only lay about three to eight, maybe nine eggs at the very most. Um, and they live in coastal habitat. So that is another area that has really, um, the habitat there has become developed. Uh, sometimes have, pollution sometimes can be an impact. Pollution problems. These guys are a little bit tolerant to pollution, but not to the levels that we're seeing. Um, and so 
it has been really hard for terrapins um, in this area. And how do we know that Gem is a female? Oh, that's a great question. So, um, Is it a different way to tell versus the eastern box turtle? Well, oftentimes we look at the tail um, on turtles. And the tail on a male turtle is generally longer. Um, and on a female, it is shorter. Um, so uh, unlike, we can't really tell with her eyes here. They, they don't have the eye color different, differentiation like our box turtles. Um, but you can often tell with the tail. Right. So every turtle is actually different. Mm -hmm. um, there's not the same guidelines for each one. Exactly. Jessica and Avery would like to know, can they pull into their shells? Because I think she's noticing that gel is, <laughs> uh, Gem is a little bit more husky than um, Clementine. Indeed. Um, so they can go partway into their shells, um, but they can't close up like a box turtle would. Um, and Gem does have a little extra meat on her because she is very well taken care of. Um, but also she does have um, and you might be noticing this little pouch right here. Um, and that's actually where she stores some of her fresh water. Right. So that's one of the adaptations for adjusting to that brackish, which is a mixture of salt and, um, and fresh water. Exactly. So um, she is able to be out in purely salt water um, for a small amount of time. Um, she has a similar adaptation to sea turtles where she can take that salt out of her body and she actually cries it out. Um, a special duct by her eye. Um, so she can secrete that salt yeah. out, which is a really cool adaptation. Yeah. Um, but she does have to go up into fresh water. Um, I've heard that it only takes them about five minutes to drink enough fresh water to hold on to that for about a week. Um, so that's where they would be storing that fresh water uh, so that they're able to go out and not worry too much about the salt. And again, when we reopen and you guys can join us, you are welcome to check out Jem. Oh, we have Barbara Harvey, one of our animal care volunteers. Hi, Hi Barbara. Jem, um, as I mentioned before, is being a bit of a celebrity here. Um, she's definitely a staff and volunteer favorite. Um, she is a great eater. She's very interactive. We like to call it turtle yoga in her exhibit. And that is in our, um, our large classroom here at the Nature Center. All right, so she did a great job. Is there anything that you would like to uh, mention about our other turtles that are just behind you? Oh, our little spot and dot there. We had um, a compliment from Rick about our awesome names that we have for our animals <laughs> here. So, uh, yeah, uh, just a, I'll briefly mention about our spotted turtles. Um, they are, again, a species of concern. Um, they, they look kind of like rocks from here. Let's see if oh, we yeah. can get down. No, not so much. Oh, not so much. Um, they are semi-aquatic, so they do like to be in shallow water. Um, they are actually a turtle that comes out before any of our other turtles. Um, so they'll come out of hibernation towards the end of winter, um, do what needs to get done to lay those eggs, and then really they spend a lot of time dormant, just kind of chilling out in the mud of uh, ponds and vernal pools and and uh, other wetland areas like that. Um, of course, those are also habitats that are very sensitive. Uh, and unfortunately, um, a lot of development is breaking up those habitats um, and breaking up the area that they're able to live in. So that's the trouble that they're having. And since we're talking about turtles, again, um, this is breeding season for many of them, in t or at least in terms of laying their eggs. So May and June tend to be some of the most common months to be able to see turtles, especially crossing the road. So as Jess said, mm -hmm. making sure um, to help them when it is safe to do so um, by crossing them in the direction in which they're headed. So that way they can lay their eggs. And then most turtles will um, hatch out of their nest sometime in that September time frame, which is pretty cool. So if you have a nest that's made in your area, sometimes what we have done here at the Nature Center, because we've had some pretty fun um, abilities to watch the turtles lay their eggs, is you could put some chicken wire around it so as to keep it um, safe and protected from maybe a dog that you might have at home. Um, and then it will, again, keep that safe from some of those predators. Now we have a question from someone who was wondering what turtle gem is. They tuned in a little late. Oh, yeah. So, so what species is she? She's the Diamondback's Harapin. Um, and Beckman would like to know, do we keep her in fresh water or do we keep her in kind of a brackish environment? She's in a large brackish tank. Um, but to counteract that salt, we do take her out of the tank and we put her in a fresh water bath every time we feed her. So she does still get fresh water every day. 
All right. Oh, Carrie's saying that she and her family enjoyed seeing them all today. Oh, also chimes in that Jem is so fancy. We agree with those, <laughs> with those markings that she has. She is pretty great. So for anyone that tuned in today, if you enjoyed watching us, we greatly appreciate you tuning in with us. Um, oh, we have a question actually from Lynn before we sign off. Where do we bring a turtle we have come across when we're out and about? Well, I would say that you should leave the turtle where you found it. Yes. Any other tips, Jess? Um, the only reason to move a turtle is if it is injured in a life-threatening situation. Um, so if its shell is cracked or it is bleeding, um, and then you can give us a call. And we do have um, turtle rehabilitators that we're in contact with um, that can help to repair that shell and, and get that turtle back to health. Right. The Nature Center for, serves as almost like a first responder for a lot of wildlife um, that come to us. We specialize and are state and federally licensed to take care of migratory birds. So our specialty is birds of prey. Um, but that being said, we work with a lot of other rehabbers to connect people that have concerns about wildlife to the right people so that those animals go into those specialist hands. Um, Thank you, Brenda, also for tuning in. And Jessica, we appreciate you guys tuning in. We also have a GoFundMe fundraiser right now. So if you guys have enjoyed tuning in, we have a post right here on our Facebook page um, that we're doing a fundraiser to help raise funds for our animals to help us care for them while we are closed. We do feed creatures every single day. We go through a lot of rodents. We also go through shellfish for gem, as you saw, crickets and other things. So if you guys would consider making a donation to us, we would greatly appreciate it and we will see you next tuesday we're actually going to be focusing on snakes next tuesday so again we do our facebook lives normally every tuesday wednesday and thursday at 10 a.m and we hope to see you then all right have a great day